On behalf of the church, I'm extremely delighted to um, welcome our special guest tonight, Masai Kahindi. Masai, would you like to come up, please? Could you please give Masai a great welcome? Yeah. So Masai is an old friend of the church, and um, he's one of our uh, missionary partners. Uh, Masai and his wife Karen work in Kenya, where Masai is from, and uh, they're involved in uh, prison ministries where they run alpha courses, and uh, they reach out to people in rural areas and also train pastors, where, uh, whereas um, Karen's also involved in um, YWAM, and um, I'll let uh, Masai tell you all about what they're doing and the progress in Kenya, and Masai will also be delivering the word for tonight. Over to you, Masai. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Isaac. I just want to commend Isaac to you. I want to say he's been formidable. He's been a great encouragement to us. Uh, always he sends us uh, messages at the right time when we needed them. And I, I really believe that he prays. Because every time he sends us the wee messages, just the wee ones, you can imagine a person with permanent Santa and saying a wee one. <laughs> I'm half Scottish, you know. <laughs> I love you, Isaac, very much. I appreciate you, my brother, because you are a great blessing. And on behalf of the church, I want to bring you greetings from my wife and my family as a whole. We're blessed with the two children who have grown now. Um, they are back in Kenya still, but they are praying for us. When I was in Glasgow after the morning service there, when I came to the train station, I phoned my wife and I said to her, I'm going to meet our friends, our dear brothers in Aberdeen. And she said to me, prepare yourself. Do you have your Longy Jones ready? So I said to her, it's not that bad yet. But I have my Longy Jones in my bag, just in case. So they send their greetings to you. We are doing very well. Uh, Ministry-wise, God has really blessed us so much. We have seen people getting saved in a very tremendous way. We have seen people that you wouldn't even imagine. We have gone in prisons. We have talked with people that were written off in society. We have shared with them the love of Jesus. I have shared with them my testimony. I've told them if Jesus could change me, he could change anybody else. And if you are here, you don't know Jesus. Take it from me. If Jesus could change me, he can change you. And so these men who are nasty pieces of work, God has changed them so nicely, now they are very nice. <laughs> to a point where the leaders of prison in Kenya, who are not Christians, they say this pastor that comes into these prisons and does this work, if he can help these inmates and change in this way, why can't he be allowed to do this work in all the prisons? So I say to them, I can't divide myself. So they gave me all their prison chaplains for me to disciple. And this was one thing I did. I said to them, a blind person cannot lead another blind one. This is a strong man, you know, the prison warders. So I said to them, now, because they were sent to me by their superiors, they could not come out of it because coming out of it is uh, losing their jobs. <laughs> so they had to listen to me whether they liked it or not. Now, I know salvation is not by force, but planting the seed. 
Hallelujah. So I preached it to them. And the gospel I preached it to them is not a Scottish gospel. You know, the one where you put sugar coating. <laughs> where you baptize the sin and call it a weakness. You know, you live in first world. I don't. I live in a third world. <laughs> the world I come from is not even second, it's third. <laughs> so we don't call sin a weakness, we call it sin. And we don't tell people that the place where they will go if they don't repent is a bad place. We call it hell. <laughs> and we don't say hell is a very uncomfortable place. We say there is fire which burns 70 times 70. <laughs> and we don't tell people that we will scare them. We tell them when you go there, you will burn. <laughs> Hello. See, I can say these things because after this I'll go away and when I come you will have forgotten what I said. <laughs> so they listened to me. And those who got saved, then I gave them clearance to go and run Alpha in their, in their prisons. And they started running Alphas. So now we have grown our Alpha courses in prisons. And so the prison authorities said, yes, this is very nice. But actually the inmates that are being reached in the prisons are the Protestants. What about the Catholics? So they phoned me and they said, we want you in a meeting at the headquarters, the Kenya prison's headquarters. And they said, Reverend, what about the Catholics? I said, well, if you invite me to talk to them, why not? The gospel is not for the chosen few. Even if you do this and this, you are also welcome. You know? So I have started training the Catholic chaplains. And they have started running Alpha. In fact, this year, for the first time, we brought Catholic chaplains from Kenya prisons to the conference. And unfortunately, this year I was not at the conference. I was intended to be there, but my parents-in-law were not well. So I had to attend to them. But it was our first time to take them there. So great things are happening. And then we, for some of you, you may not know this. But those who have been here for a long time, you remember I used to tell you that we used to get some converts from Islam and we had a place where we used to hide them. Is there anybody who remembers that? I don't tend to talk a lot about this. But because you are very dear to us and I know you pray, I want to tell you this. Two of those guys that we have been hiding we helped them to go to America to Bible school. And one of them has done so well. He's finished Bible school. He's married to an American girl. And he is now pastoring a church in America. He sent me an email two days ago and I was in the train. And this is what he said. Masai, you are my spiritual father and my big brother. And I want to tell you that you have done something I will never forget in my life. Because you have not only helped me to grow in my faith, but you have changed the way I see this world. Because you've directed me to love Jesus. And it's something that I will never change. That's fantastic, isn't it? But while all these good things were happening, last year I got sick. I got so sick, I'd never been sick. Last time when I was here, I didn't have that mark there. See that mark on my neck? I never had that mark. I was really handsome, young and handsome. <laughs> but the devil wanted to kill me, he couldn't, so he gave me that mark. And I promised him I will preach like I will never preach again. <laughs> I was so sick that I could not turn myself in bed. 
And I went for tests after tests, tests after tests. The doctors tell me they see nothing. In fact, a couple of doctors, very top doctors, they said to me, Mr. Kahindi, we have done all the tests we can and we feel that our consensus as doctors, we feel that um, maybe the problem you have is caused by stress. What kind of work do you do, Mr. Kahindi? I looked at them straight in the eye and I said, doctors, with all due respect, the kind of work I do, if you were to advise me to stop doing it, that's the time when I will have stress. And it's an honest truth. If you tell me not to preach, that's when I will begin to have stress. What do I do? Watch telly. <laughs> I was born a preacher. When Jesus touched my heart and changed me, there is nothing else I can talk about uh, apart from talking about Jesus and his goodness. So if you tell me to stop talking about Jesus, what do I talk about? There is nothing else for me to talk about. I can't talk about neighbors. And so I prayed. And you know, in those days, you begin to ask, why me, Lord, why me? Even me as a preacher. You tell people, trust God. God is going to come through for you, my brother. God is going to come through for you, my sister. But when you yourself, you are caught, you begin to say, why me, Lord? I've been there. Eh? I say, Lord, why me? These hands of mine, you see, friends, and this is not an exaggeration. I have placed them on sick people and they've got healed instantly like that. I said, Lord, I've used my hands to heal other people. I put them on myself. Why can't I be healed? God has a sense of humor. I wasn't healed. So I say, why me? Why? 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 Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like the world is crumbling all over you? And you begin to say, why? And I said, Lord, do something. The enemy was having a party. And one doctor came from India, a specialist, a spine specialist. And then he came, he said, I want to send you for an MRI scan. That day I prayed. I was sick, but still I fasted. No haggas, no tatties. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, sometimes you have to, to sacrifice haggas and tatties. I was sick. My wife said, well, you know, you are sick already. I said, well, if I get finished because no haggas and tatties, that's fine. And then the following day, I went for this MRI scan. Very scary thing. I'd never been in a white grave. <laughs> and you don't go feet first, you go head first. <laughs> and no clothes. Just a very thin gown. You are told even the underwear, no. And the thing makes noise. It's like you are going to hell already. <laughs> and then when I came out, I tested myself if I was still alive. And the doctor then said, yes, you have a problem. And the problem is at the back of your neck, there is, they call them discs. I said, CDs. He said, no, 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 disc. <laughs> and so he said to me, I have good news and bad news. He said, do you want to, which one do you want to hear first? I said, I am always for good news, not bad news. He said, you have to hear both. I said, if you insist. But my interest is good news, not bad news. He said, you have to hear both. So I said, begin with bad news. Then I can finish with the good news. He said, the only thing that will save you from this problem is an operation. He said, and that operation, the bad news is, 
if it goes bad, you will be paralyzed for your life. I said, may the Lord forbid. And he wasn't a Christian, he was a Hindu. He said, what do you mean with that? I said, may God forbid that I should be paralyzed because I still have some work to do. He said, and the good news is, if that operation goes well, it will really go well because you will be healed instantly. And by that time, I couldn't lift my left hand. I couldn't even walk properly because my leg, there was pain. I had never experienced pain like that. Even these fingers, I could not fold them like that. And he said, so choose. It didn't take me long. I looked at my wife. I was in tune with the Lord anyway. And the Lord said, I am in charge. I said, I know, Lord, you are in charge, but I'm in pain. (laughs) And all that time you were in charge, but I'm in pain. You know, sometimes this Pentecostal stuff sometimes goes out of the window. (laughs) Take it from me, and I'm a Pentecostal pastor. (laughs) I'm telling you the truth, brethren. Sometimes we are too Pentecostal. But when the rubber hits the road, all we have to say is, Lord, help. (laughs) Hallelujah. And I went to Bible school, by the way, and a good one. (laughs) Even sometimes I use King James, thou sayest. (laughs) But there are some times when thou sayest it doesn't come. (laughs) I have two degrees, by the way. But that thou sayest sometimes goes out of the window. Why? Because I was in pain. So I just said, yes, Lord, I know you are in charge. But you are in charge and this side is like, you know, doesn't work. And he said this, go for the operation. Well, I'm not afraid to die, but I think, yeah, I leave my children, I leave my wife. I thought, eh. honestly speaking, brethren, me, I'm not afraid of going to heaven. But I was thinking, mm. who's going to look after my children? They're still young. My wife. You know, you think about these things. If you're a real man, there are some people who are half men. You know, if you're really half man, you think about yourself. But I'm a total man. So I was thinking, yeah. the Lord said go. So I said to my wife, I'm going to go for this operation. She said, are you sure? I said, very sure. Why are you sure? I said, the Lord has said. And when you say to my wife, the Lord has said, she has no question marks. <laughs> because she loves the Lord, you see. Is there anybody who is not married here? Hands up. Don't marry a woman who doesn't love the Lord, even if she looks like, you know, whatever, a model. Because if you marry her, you are marrying problems. I'm telling you, and it's an honest truth. Marry a woman who loves the Lord. When the rubber hits the road and you are, you are in the thick of things, she will come alongside you and say, you see, women were created to be encouragers. They will come and sit next to you and say, it shall be well. And you feel niceness if there is any English word like that. <laughs> I went to India. The operation was done. And I remember waking, I went there. I didn't go with my wife because our children were still, my children, my son was still in school. I went there with a very close pastor friend of mine. He took me to India. And uh, after the operation, I was opening my eyes in the recovery room. And I saw these small, small Indians with white gowns. I thought I was already in heaven. 
then I opened nicely my eyes. I saw this pastor friend of mine. I said, ah, so I am not in heaven yet. <laughs> and I want to say just one thing and then I leave that story there. One of the things that uh, horrified me and I want to tell you Friends, we are nothing without God. It doesn't matter what you have, what you own. We are completely nothing without Jesus. I remember that day when I was put in a tray, like a piece of meat, to be taken for that operation. There was nobody there. I wasn't Reverend Kahindi, I wasn't Missionary Kahindi, I was, I was just a thing. The only person who was there at that time with me was Jesus. And I want to say to you, if you have flesh and blood, that time will come when one day you will be completely useless. You won't be able to have, to have control of yourself. And you will need God. Will you have him on your side? I didn't have control of my body. In fact, I remember the day after the operation, a woman came and she didn't speak good English. So she said to me, you, bath. I said, what do you mean me, bath? She says, yeah, you, bath. I had this big collar support. I said, what do you mean me, bath? She said, you, bath. I said, what do you mean? She says, yeah, you, bath. And suddenly she came. I had this thin gown. Poor me. And I, she had this towel. Put it in water. So I thought she's going to give me. She fling this thing out. And she started giving me bath. Even in places where she shouldn't touch. <laughs> I've never been given a bath by a woman. I remember phoning my wife. And said I've been violated. Anyway, I see my time says minus one, and I want to read you a portion of scripture. I don't want to be a thief of time, because I know you guys, you have a problem. You have clocks and watches, but you don't have time. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 to 14 I will just read this and then I highlight a few things. So I think, will it be okay if I take three minutes? Yeah. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 14. In this particular portion of scripture, the Apostle Paul says this. Although I might be able to put trust in myself, if anyone thinks he has a reason to trust in himself, he should know that I have greater reason for trusting in myself. I was circumcised eight days after my birth. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew and my parents were Hebrews. I had a strict view of the law, which is why I became a Pharisee. I was so enthusiastic, I tried to hurt the church. No one could find fault with the way I obeyed the law of Moses. Those things were important to me, but now I think they are worth nothing because of Christ. Not only those things, but I think that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have lost all those things, and now I know they are worthless trash. This allows me to, know, to have Christ and to belong to him. Now I am right with God, not because I followed the law, but because I believe in Christ. God uses my faith to make me right with him. I want to know Christ and the power that raised him from the dead. I want to share in his suffering and become like him in his death. Then I have hope that I myself will be raised from the dead. I do not mean that I am already as God wants me to be, I have not yet reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it and make it mine. 
Christ wants me to do that, which is the reason he made me his. Brothers and sisters, I know that I have not yet reached that goal, but there is one thing I always do. Forgetting the past and straining towards what is ahead, I keep trying to reach the goal and get the price for which God called me through Christ to live uh, to life above. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. What I want to highlight to you is this. Paul was passionate about Jesus. Above everything else that happened in Paul's life, his passion and his delight was Jesus. Everything that he did revolved about Jesus. And as Christians, we need to know who we are, where we are, and where we are going. Many times when I meet with Christians, they are like, they don't know who they are. We are children of God. We, God has made available all the resources that he wants us to have. So we should not fear. We should not fear anything because God is on our side. Friends, many times in Kenya, I have faced so many challenges, but every time I am reminded that I am a child of God. Yes, I may lack things. Yes, I may go through difficult things, uh, situations, but God is on my side. And Paul says, if God be for us, then who can be against us? What is your really purpose and, 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 and passion in life? What makes you tick when you wake up in the morning? Is it your work? Is it making money? I have news for you. God did not create any one of you here today to always wake up in the morning, go to work, and pay bills. That was not the purpose that God created you for. God created you for a specific purpose. The Bible says in Jeremiah, I have plans for you. And those plans that God has for you, it's not for your pastor to tell you, this is the plan of God for you. Or for a preacher like me to come and say, this is the plan of God for you. It is for you to find out what the will of God is for you. Hallelujah. I told you I can say these things because after this I'll go away. But it's true. And when you know what God wants you to do, you are liberated. Friends, one of the things that I enjoy, I don't have a lot of things. I struggle every now and then. I have this and this. I mean, I share some things sometimes with Isaac and I, we communicate a lot. Thank God for, um, you know, commun his communication nowadays. And people here pray. But one thing is this, I am so happy doing what I do and I can't change it for the world because if I change it, I will not be happy. Hallelujah. So some, some of my, my elder brother sometimes he says, are you crazy? I say, I think maybe I am. You know, if you do the will of God, you will look crazy. The Bible says the wisdom of God is foolishness into this world. Brothers and sisters, I want to say this. Love Jesus and everything will fall into place. Jesus is our sufficiency. If you love Jesus, if Jesus is in your heart, you have everything. May the Lord bless you. Amen.